All right, hey game design community. Uh, my name is Dennis Furia, and I'm the creator of the upcoming game Deck of Wonders. Uh, this is my first time through the game design process, and um, it's just been an amazing community to become a part of. Uh, Y'all out there are so supportive and encouraging, um, great advice and insight, and I kind of wanted to share and share alike, just like everyone has done for me. So while this is my first time through the game design process, I actually have a decade of experience in brand strategy and innovation, mostly for Fortune 500 companies. And I found that those skills are very, very useful in my process with Deck of Wonders. So I, I put a quick poll out to the community asking, hey, is there, is there brand strategy stuff that would be helpful to you? And overwhelmingly heard back that the, the most important topic is how to clearly communicate the equity of your game uh, equity meaning the personality or identity or value of your game to someone else. And a close second to that was the importance of, of needing to internalize or organize your own thoughts around the equity of your game. So equity is something I'm very familiar with and that uh, I've, I have a couple great tools um, that I've used on, on other brands and now in game design. And I thought I'd put something together to, to share with everyone else. So without further ado, let's jump into the board game Equity Pyramid. You'll see this up on your screen. We're just gonna talk through this, um, but this borrows from uh, a ton of different tools and frameworks. If anyone is familiar with Simon Sinek and his kind of golden circle speech or his book, Start With Why, that's in here. Um, there are principles from game design itself that I've, I've kind of picked up and incorporated in. Uh, there's a fair amount of business model canvas thinking or lean thinking involved in this. So it, it's a whole bunch of really cool frameworks from the corporate world put together and applied specifically to board games. Um, when you communicate about your board game, you want to communicate from the top of the pyramid down. The most important thing is the why, then the how, then the what. And we'll get into each of those. Uh, but think about it this way. If you have 10 seconds with someone who's interested in your game, you want to be able to communicate the why. Uh, if you have 30 seconds, you can communicate the why and the how. And if you've got a minute or, or more, you can, you can hit all the high notes. You can do why, how, and what. But having that organized up front and in your mind is not only helpful as you're making design, design decisions and, and creating the game, but then when you're talking to people about it, when you're getting people excited about the game, uh, it'll make you that much more clear and compelling. And compelling is the part of, of the core fantasy of the game. So let's talk about the why. Um, the why applied to board games is what I would call the core fantasy of the game. And again, this comes out of the game design world. Um, I know Blizzard, the video game studio, uh, uses this a lot. And I'm going to interpret it for us today as the compelling experience that you want your players to have. Every game, no matter uh, what type of game, who made it, etc., is trying to give its players an experience. And then there are a huge amount of experiences you can have through gaming that's part of why we love it. Um, but every game is trying to get the players to have an experience. And so the, the clearer you can communicate, hey, this is the experience, the better. Um, and, and note I say a compelling experience because I think it's really interesting that sometimes you, you might have a really cool experience that gets you excited, but if it's not compelling to anyone else, if that, that core fantasy that you're inviting them to live uh, doesn't really get them excited or, or, or doesn't seem like something they want to engage with, you're going to have a, have a lot of trouble getting people to engage with your game. So the core fantasy of the game, the why for your game, is going to be the compelling experience that you want your players to have. And that core fantasy should resonate across both theme and mechanics. And this is probably the biggest way that, that this tool or this framework differs from your traditional equity pyramid is typically why, how, and what are all one bucket. Um, but as you think about games, it's such a unique thing because there is both uh, theme and gameplay going on at once. And I think each of those deserves to be broken out individually. So um, even though those are broken out, even those can, though those can be very different. So for example, you can have a game that's themed after like cute farmyard animals, but it is a ruthless screw your neighbor kind of gameplay structure. Um, those two things kind of compete or, or contrast in very interesting ways that can really only exist in gaming. Um, the core fantasy, your why, kind of connects them and, and connects them in your mind, connects them in your potential consumer's mind. Once you get down to the how, uh, on the theme side of things, I would describe the how as the tone of your game. And this is where, uh, using this tool, I'm gonna force you guys to be very, very concise. Pick just three words, three adjectives that capture the tone of your game. So is it, is it dark? 
Is it slapstick? Is it adventurous? Um, capture three adjectives that, uh, that represent the overall tone of your game. On the gameplay side, I think the how is the structure. And this is gonna feel a little more uh, perfunctory. This is all the wayfinding descriptors that you might use to find the game on Board Game Geek uh, or, or in a store. So uh, what genre is it in? Is it a deck builder? Is it a tactics game? What's the player count? Is it a party game? Is it a solo game? Um, and, and maybe even what the weight of the game is. You know, how, how difficult is it? How rules heavy is it? Those kind of things belong in the gameplay's structure. So if you can know the, the personality of your game in terms of the tone, those three adjectives, and you can clearly articulate the, the structure on the gameplay side of the game, you can give people very quickly a clear idea of kind of what's going on under the hood of this core fantasy that you're getting them excited about. Finally, there's the what, and this is kind of the highest level of detail um, at the bottom of the pyramid. So on the theme side, this is where you start to get into the setting and the story. Are you a sky captain? Are you a submarine diver or a mafia boss or, or what have you? Uh, and then on the gameplay side, what are the hooks that set your game apart? Um, you might also hear these referred to as points of difference, but through a gameplay lens. So what are the unique or iconic mechanics that set your game apart? This can be either feel, feel different than anything else out there, or you can do something that has clear analogs, but you're doing it better um, in, in some way. So on the what side, you wanna communicate the theme, which is the setting or the story. It doesn't have to be a ton of words. You can see it's, it's not a large box, but you can kind of distill that down. Um, and then on the gameplay side, what are the hooks um, that get people coming and engaging with your game from a mechanical standpoint? You'll see under that, I have a huge section dedicated to notes. And that's because I'm a big fan of not kind of hanging yourself by the frameworks that you're trying to use to help you. So this, this serves your thinking. And if there's something that you feel is important that doesn't quite fit into those boxes or you're, you're not quite sure where it fits in those boxes yet, still capture it, still write it down. And as you work on the game, as you get feedback on it, that'll either become clear where it belongs or maybe it'll become clear that it doesn't belong. Uh, and that is a very quick walkthrough of the board game equity pyramid. I will give an example um, for myself, what I've been doing for Deck of Wonders. Um, so the core fantasy of Deck of Wonders is to outplay your opponent even when fate stacks the deck against you. And if I've got 10 minutes to sell you on a gaming experience, that's what I'm going to tell you. Um, and that should be exciting and compelling all on its own. Uh, moving to the next level of detail, the, the theme of the game, the tone of the game is whimsical, cunning, and adaptable. And I almost think of a character when I start using these adjectives, and I think of Rafiki from The Lion King, where he's, he's whimsical. He's kind of not quite all there, it doesn't seem like, but there's a lot going on to the surface, and he's kind of manipulating things and, and uh, being smart and cunning in ways that you don't initially realize. Uh, on the structure side, uh, Deck of Wonders is a solitaire living card game with legacy elements. Uh, that's a very dense sentence, but that kind of encapsulates the key mechanical structure of the game uh, for someone who's trying to understand, okay, do I play this with friends or on my own? Okay, it's a solitaire game. What kind of game is it? It's kind of a deck builder, living card game. Oh, and it evolves as I play. There's legacy elements. And so just between those three elements, the core fantasy, the tone, and the structure, uh, I've painted a, a broad picture of Deck of Wonders that can get people excited. Moving to the next level of detail, the what. The setting and story is that the Deck of Wonders is the prized magical possession of fate herself. And when you come into possession of it, she unleashes all manner of magical minions to take it back. Um, and you can see that that kind of ladders up into the, the whimsical tone, uh, etc. On the hook side, um, there's a couple gameplay hooks. So there's cards that change depending on which side draws them. Um, there are rules, cards, and challenges that evolve over time, touching on that legacy element. And there's the fact, and I'm, I'm very passionate about this, that it's a portable experience. So it's something like Star Realms that you can tuck into your pocket, um, build a deck and just have that with you and not need you know, a huge table's amount of space. You can play it in a coffee shop uh, or on lunch break. Uh, down in notes, there's a couple things that I, I wasn't sure exactly where to put um, or if they were important to talk about. First off is a, a, an analog that I use for Deck of Wonders is the experience of playing Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering. For people who have played those games, it's a great, great handle. For people who haven't played those games, it does nothing. So is it worth putting up into the structure section? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and then in the notes, the, I, I really want to emphasize that the rules, play style, and even win conditions can change dramatically uh, based on what villain you're facing off against. So if you're trying to outplay an opponent in a solitaire game, I better have 
um, some fun, compelling villains on the other side, as it were. Um, and they should offer uh, really interesting experiences so that people want to play different opponents uh, in the game. And that's my walkthrough. That's, that's the framework. Um, I would love to see you uh, take this, and I'll, I'll put a link up to it, and apply it to your own game. And just see where you get. Share it. Um, and, and I love talking about this stuff. It's my job. It's my passion. Um, or, you know, if you're not working on a game right now, pick a popular game. Gloomhaven or um, Wingspan or chess or poker, you know, anything. Um, and write it up in this framework and post it up, see if other people agree or not. Thank you so much for listening. Again, I'm Dennis Furia. I am the creator of Deck of Wonders, and I hope this has been as helpful to you all as you all have been to me. Thanks. <laughs>